انا بالسقم دهرا طاري If I have to pray somewhere else, I ask someone if they can put my prayer mat in the right direction for me, and then I use the prayer mat as a guide. This is what my daughter does every time she sees a prayer mat on the floor. I love you for infinity. Why do I read? <laughs> what a stupid question. I read because this world is not enough for me. You don't find that suspicious? You don't find that suspicious? No further questions. <laughs> Son, what's that? Seriously, father? It's a crow. Oh. Son. What's that? Is this a game? I have things to do, okay? It's a crow. It's a you can't see. I just got you new glasses last month. How is this why is this happening to me? Dad, why are you so difficult? I don't understand what the problem is. Just tell me what you really want. I'm busy, okay? The dad pulls out his journal. This is, son, um, this is something that happened 30 years ago. We were walking down this park. You saw a crow. And you asked me 30 times. And I gave you a smile every time. You couldn't handle twice. What are we giving our parents? I can't afford to lose me again. I can't afford to lose me again. I can't afford to lose me again. Okay. Um, so this is a very, like, um, when I was reading an outline and I saw this question, this one really pang my heart and I had to stop for a second. And I, like, got really teary-eyed, I guess, because this is something that I have dealt with since the beginning of time. So I guess on a different level, I was born with my disability. My disability is all I know. From birth, I was diagnosed. Like it was completely unexpected. I was rushed to hospitals. I wasn't supposed to survive, but I mean, humble I'm here today. I was expected to pass away after a couple of months. That was what the doctors were saying, but humble like I'm here. So I'm so grateful for that. But something that I combated with a lot in Muslim spaces was you know, that idea that, and I, I acknowledge and understand completely that my disability and my existence and my presence is a very big reminder that, um, you know, Allah can create anybody in any essence. He can create anybody in any way with any challenges. He can, he, he knows. People say I'm quiet most of the time. If only you knew what goes on in my my cat kept going on my prayer mat, so I got her her own one.
Me? Am I the drama? I don't think I'm the drama. Am I the bad guy? I don't think I'm the bad guy. Wait till the harem police realize that making Islamic art is my whole damn job. Never let them make you feel not Muslim enough. Just hustle on. So I'll just be like, yeah, I don't drink. I never have. And then it'll be like, really? And I'm like, yeah, and then it'll be, and they'll always say this, oh, cause like you had a big problem and now you don't anymore. And I'm like, nah, I just don't. Really? Yep. Ever? Ever. Never. That's the same thing as ever. Zero times? That's what I'm saying. Not even once. I just said zero. How's it once? That's like being like, do you have a pen? No. You got two pens? Like what? Short story about how I lose my sight. When I was 11 years old, my left eye began to see worse and worse from year to year. When I was 18 years old, they could finally find out that I had the eye disease retinitis pigmentosa. Since 2017, when I was 20 years old, I can still see 2% and since then I'm legally blind. And my right eye is a prosthesis, since I was two years old. Listen to how Muslim scholars classified and diagnosed mental health a thousand years before the West did. One of the first things I did when I entered into the field of psychiatry is I wanted to know what the early Muslims had said about mental health. And so I looked at multiple, what we call primary texts, the early texts of the Muslim scholars, because I was sure that they must have written about mental health in a way that they wrote about medicine and surgery and humanities and all different sciences that we celebrate. But I didn't hear anything about mental health. And so in that search, mashallah, we were able to find so many different scholars that talked about mental health, one of whom is named Abu Zayd al-Balqi. He's from the 9th century. And he has a book called Sustenance of the Body and Soul. And in his section on mental health, he classifies all these different mental health illnesses, one of which is we call OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And as a modern day trained psychiatrist, I'm reading something from the 9th century that looks so much like what we diagnose today as OCD. But OCD is supposed to be something that's a new illness that's discovered in the 19th century and written about then. And I was comparing side by side what Al-Balqi wrote to what the current DSM, which is our book where we diagnose as psychiatrists mental illnesses, and they looked so similar. So I ran across the hall to where one of the main heads of OCD in our department was, and I said, I think I found something that actually might be earlier than what the books are saying. And he said, no, 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 that can't really be. And I said, well, can you read in Arabic? And he said, no, can you? And I said, yes. He said, well, then go ahead and translate it and come back. And when I did, it was a point by point connection. Everything in Belhi diagnosed was actually what we have in the current DSM about OCD. And he said, you must publish this now. And subhanAllah, we were able to publish it. And it actually turns over history because history needs to be rewritten that the Muslims were actually some of the very first to diagnose and classify. This is our heritage, our legacy. We need to reclaim it. I've buried almost eight brothers in the last five weeks, all of which were under the age of 25, all of which were under the age of 25 years old. And they didn't die because I was sick. They didn't die because, you know what, he had some illness that doctors couldn't work out. No, perfectly fine boys. Wallahi, one of them, one of them, 18 years old, built like a tank. We actually had to bend his legs when we put him into the ground. He was so big, we actually couldn't fit him into the hole. We actually had to bend his legs to get him in there. Eight, under the age of 25. And ask me how many of them prayed. None of them. How many of them were familiar with Quran? None of them. This, this is what the people around them are telling me. This is what their friends are telling me. My brothers, you sick, you hopeful, thinking I have a long life. What gives you this hope, my brother? You don't want to die. Wallahi, wallahi, wallahi. Ahwal, man, ahwal. Ahwal. Brothers come up to me, imagine, right? Brothers dying, no salah, clean shaven. Uh, 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 in the state of Zina. One brother was actually in the state of Zina. Yeah? 
And then his friend comes up to me with tears in his eyes. He says to me, brother, is he going to Jannah? But قال لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة. But brother, if this is your understanding of Deen, والله you're in a world to hurt man. Yes, man. قال لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة. Yes, but that's a prerequisite, my brother. If I say لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله, but I don't believe in angels, is there Jannah for me? I don't believe in Quran, is there Jannah for me? I don't believe in hellfire and paradise, is there Jannah for me? But the Hadith says من قال لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة. No, my brother, no. It's not that easy. Did a speech at the Muslim girls' school with having a stammer. This is how it went. My name is Basil Sheikh. I am here to talk about my speech journey. I can't wait to tell you about it. So, A bit about myself. I am. I am. I am. Eighteen years old, and I was. I need. I was born with a with a medical condition called called Mosaic Edwards Syndrome. It was it was when I was three I I Developed a a a speech impediment, which, by the way, is is not caused or connected to this syndrome. But first, I want to ask you all a question.